Hello, Mallory. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Lisa, I'm great. Thank you. I'm just excited to be here. Let me get a couple things going here. Hey, guys. Hello. Hi. Okay. Right. Here we go. All right. All right. I see it's six o'clock. How's everybody doing? Anybody have any good stories from this week? Anything exciting happening anywhere, anytime? I got slime today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're we're doing uh, every, every other Wednesday, we do a reward for students turning in all their assignments. So this one was, are you smarter than a middle school um, student? The pop culture edition. So they mm -hmm. submitted a bunch of different questions about a lot of it was TikTok and Among Us and all this. So. I didn't answer enough questions, so I got ice bucketed and, and uh, slimed. Well, good for you. Yeah. Break, they're breaking me in. Yeah. yeah. That's Back your in, fault for agreeing to do it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's known as operator error. Yeah. Um, you, flew, you flew yourself into the side of that mountain. Mm -hmm. so. there, there are easier ways to be popular. I, I was just doing what the boss lady was telling me to do. It was her idea. Yeah, I'm sure it was. She was operating under that famous administrative axiom, me first, then you. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think she might have knew some of the answers and cheated before that test. Yeah. yeah. She didn't get any consequences. Right. Yeah. It had to be a case study. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought you might have been referring. You said you got slime. The five years I was an elementary principal, I used to come home every day right across the front of my pants, about pocket level, where all the kids would come running up and rub their face across your pants. Slime you good? Yeah. <clears throat> Some of that stuff, was, I'm sure that stuff had more germs in it than COVID. It would just kill me graveyard dead today if, I, if they did that to me. So. Uh, but yes, I thought that's what you meant. You got slimed by the kid running the nose on you. All right. So anybody that have any other exciting stories for the evening? We need to get started. I believe Kevin's got to go to ED. Got to go to his real class now, uh, EDCI. So we're gonna let that group go first. I'm gonna share my. I'm going to make. Um, who am I gonna make the host? Or I can pull it up. Or I prefer y'all to pull it up. Um, I, I can share. All right, so I'm going to make you the host. I'm going to go to Kevin Moore, make host. Yes, I do want to change. I'm going to pause. I am going to stop my video. That generally helps.
There we go. All right. All right. Can everybody see what we share? Sure. All right. Awesome. All right. So I'll go ahead and get us started. So everybody read the case study one. Will Bobby, um, well, sorry. I'm clicking all the buttons. Will cheating strike out Bobby? So the first question, what should the principal's course of action be? So this kind has of give a, a, kind of give us some background on this. You don't have to go too deep, but give us a little context here. Are you talking about from the case study itself? Yeah, kind of give oh. us that, kind of your, your highlights here of the particulars. Okay, so basically a, a teacher has approached the principal saying that this, this student has cheated on this assignment. Um, this student's going to get a zero and it's going to fail. It's going to result in a failing grade for the student. Um, and then there's some political factors because, you know, Bobby's, you know, super baseball star and he has some influence, it seems like, at the, at the county level. So the, uh, the principal's dealing with, you know, the teacher is upset because the teacher wants the school to follow its handbook policy. You know, the principal is also trying not to, you know, hurt the feelings of other people that could have political interest in the school when it comes to Bobby being able to participate as a baseball player. All um, right. and one thing we talked about, too, that's kind of unique, um, and I don't think you mentioned this, Kevin. So Bobby, like, readily admits that he did it. It's not like they caught him or, you know, he's denying it. He came clean, like, yes, I did this, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but now... <clears throat> Let's, <clears throat> a little more context here. What kind of assignment was this? Was it a state exam? Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, was like a it was class, it was a class assignment, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it was a class assignment. Now, does the handbook say that you can fail for the year? or cheating on any assignment or even a class assignment? Does the handbook say that you can fail for the year? No, no. Uh, yeah, the, the excerpt that I took from uh, the handbook for the school that I'm at now is no assignments can be worth more than the fifth for more than the 15% of a student's grade for each marking period, nor can homework determine a student's status of passing or failing a class. Right. All right, so we have to be clear here. We have to know what kind of assignment it is. He did admit this. There's no debate whether he cheated or not, but he cheated on a class assignment, a turn in. And you were to look at your district, as Kevin just said, what's the most that you could do? And what is your, what's your code of conduct say the range for cheating dishonesty is? Now, we're talking about the grade that the student can receive on that assignment. Now, as we know, the most that a state exam can count is 30%, the least is 20%. And everything falls down the line from that. And so outside assignments can't count more than 15% of the grade in any marking period. So, so realistically, this one class assignment shouldn't count more than about one or two percentage points on the entire yearly grade. Except the teacher has made this particular class assignment count more than, according to the case, more than 50% of the final grade, twice as much as the state exam. <clears throat> All right, pick it up from there. Okay, so just to highlight what we talked about as a group is, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are doing what the handbook says so that, you know, if, if the student cheated, then the student should be held accountable for the cheating and that the student would get a zero for that assignment, but making sure that the teacher is aware that we also, if she wants to follow the student handbook, that we also have to follow the, the part where this is not going to fail him for the class. And then the last thing that Jamie was saying is, you know, it's a great opportunity to go to Bobby one-on-one -on -one and say, you know what, like, it takes a lot of guts to own up when you make a mistake, you know, using it as a, 
a learning, a learning, a teachable moment. And then we look at the due process here. The school's rules and policies are fair in and of themselves, but the teacher did not carry these out in a fair manner. The teacher has to also follow the list of rules for which she is trying to hold Bobby accountable. Um, the teacher is abusing their power by allowing the weight of that assignment to fail Bobby. The influence of Mr. Michaels could set up an abuse of power in this situation. Mr. Michaels was the the, the political outsider that has a lot of influence, you know, with the count, the district. All right, I'm gonna pass it off to another group member. Okay, um, well, we looked at the four ethical paradigms and um, kind of talked about through how we made our decision, each of those. So the first was justice, and we thought about, you know, what was fair about it, um, about what our suggested course of action would be. Let me scare race heads over. Um, so we felt that, you know, we were upholding fairness and following the policy that cheating would result in a zero, but you have to also, you know, the teacher also has to uphold fairness and not allowing one assignment to fail the child for the whole class um, as well. And then we talked a lot about too, just like the idea of um, issues of like equity and fairness for sports and athletes you want to make sure you're not sending a message that um you, you got to hold everybody the same standard there's not like some people get special treatment because they're the star athlete and or, you know the coach or an influential person put that um pressure on the principal you know she starts to think about those ideas to make sure that she's not you know that she's being fair to everyone um in that situation I don't think I can click. Okay. Um, and then we talked a lot about care because we, we looked at it from both the sense of care for, um, you know, the student learning as lesson, but also the care for um, how we could help the teacher address that so that situation doesn't happen again. But um, so we, we thought that the way our, our suggestion for how to handle that would show care for the student um, and hopefully help him understand that being honest is a good thing that, you know, although you're honest, we're, we have to um, hold you accountable for the, the consequences um, and just make him see that he has to hold up his quit, um, commitment to academics as well as athletics. Um, talked about showing care by helping him understand his priorities, doing the right thing, he was forthcoming. Of course, we would um, commend him for that, but and, but you want him to learn the value of hard work. And I think it was just, he just turned in something, he copied it from somewhere else. Um, so he really didn't do the work for that one, for that assignment. Um, so as Kevin said, we would commend him on being transparent and admitting that he was wrong, but we would also talk to him about, you know, as kind of the star athlete, you have to, you're, you're setting the example for, um, the others on your team or other athletic teams and so you know that's part of sort of addressing his um social emotional learning you know the, the well-roundedness of him as well um we talked about you know being showing care in that we're upholding the school policy to fellow student and how that to not fail a student how that would build trust not only with bobby but with also with others that might be in that same um, situation like we're going to hold you accountable but we're going to make sure that it's fair that you know the policy is being carried out completely so that's fair um, and we talked a lot about changing kind of the culture of the grading system to build trust with the students like because we said and I'm sure you know it happens right but um, why would a teacher let that one thing be what fails him for the whole year you know and so that's kind of a culture issue thinking about what um, it wasn't even like a test you know so, I mean, not that it wasn't important, but still um, just having some conversations with your faculty and looking at your grading policy too and thinking about what's the point of grades, you know, or, or the grades aren't meant to be the gotcha there to um, help the kids know what they have to learn, right? And help you know what to learn too. Would you let Bobby, would you let Bobby uh, redo this assignment for uh a lower grade or would you give him the zero? Well, our, our policy is you can't give anybody a zero. They can at least get a 50 to redo it. Um, mm -hmm. 
That's, that's, the, that's the same for ours too. Yeah. Yeah. No one gets a zero. You can redo at least to get a 50. You um, remember last week when, when Steve said you, the difference between a kid coming in and saying, I did it and, and a kid coming in and say, prove it. And you'd have to spend four hours. What did Bobby do right away? He just owned up to it. Yeah. So, I mean, when we were thinking about her course of action, we didn't even have to say investigate it. Right. <laughs> the hard part was done. For. Right. Yeah. She already had that part done. So, I mean, and, and really, you know, I, I do think that's commendable, especially given the position he's in. And I'm sure he knew that he had these outside influences, you know, in the coach or whatever. So that was, I mean, I, I, we, we talked a lot about that, um, you know, commending him for being honest when he, could have at least made it hard for us, you know. <laughs> Just remembering that the the purpose of the assignment is for the student to learn. So if he didn't actually do the assignment, like he needs to do the assignment so he actually gets the content. And there yeah. you go. Yeah. There you go. And why are we why are we assigning work and grades to begin with? That goes back to the the, the very essence of why we assign work. Why would you just give him a failing grade and move on? All right, so I, I've got to ask this. So, so if if I'm Bobby and you can't give me below a fifty, and you have told me <laughs> that I have to redo this, but I'm not going to make but a fifty, then why would I do it? That's a good question, <laughs> especially for a teenager, right? A high exactly. And, yeah. and, 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 and if I ended up doing it, I may not copy it this time, but it sure isn't going to be uh, suitable well, for publication. Yeah, quality work. See, what I would do. No, is... you don't tell them what you would do, Dale. <laughs> well, hopefully. They put them in. Um, like academic recovery and you have to do it. If you don't do it in your, on your own, you know, to get the, the reduced grade, um, you don't really get it, you know, <laughs> to sit there until you do it. I don't know that that's necessarily the right answer either, but. I mean, this is one of the, the flaws of the nothing less than a 50 idea, right? Well, what's Steve said, I can't tell you what I'd do. So what would you do? I mean, how are you going to make Bobby give his best effort and still not get but a 50 because he cheated the first time? Involve his coach. I think his coach was kind of speaking up to let him slide, wasn't he? It might uh, correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the coach was one of those kind of like, oh, come on, he's a good kid. Um, I'm not saying it was. Now, <laughs> Steve and I were both coaches at one time. You're giving us way too much credit. Um, I, don't, I, don't know about, I don't know about you coaches now. I, I don't, that, that's another issue entirely that we'd have to go down a rabbit hole and talk about. What about if you said, you know, if you redo this, you can make up to an 80. Well, I was going to say if, if you have flexibility in the pot, pot in the, the in the policy, but um, and this is a half glass half full kind of statement that I'm going to make here. But um, I would hope if I've been you know committed him for being honest, worked with him, try to really make him see what was you did you you know the value of hard work. This is why the assignment is there. That you know there might be a little intrinsic motivation to work on it. That that's probably a little. Um, Pollyanna, but you know, that could be a conversation part of the conversation and talking to him about it. Um, but One thing that we've had issues with at um, our school is there are some teachers who are very lenient and say, okay, you were honest. The well, if you do it, we'll give you up to an 80, 70 or 80. But there's other teachers who are just flat out, no, flat you can out. get a 50, you got to do it. Um, you have to do it and I'll give you a 50. So the, I think the difference in that and the difference in the um, expectations across the school, it would make it a lot easier on everybody if it was consistent. But I know that's really, I don't, I don't know, that goes back to that has to be written very clearly in the policy for that to take place. 
And when we talked about, you know, having that conversation about just kind of the school culture of why, why are you giving grades and what's it really about and how, do the, how does the grade help the student? So I think as teachers, we need to talk about that, but we need to talk about it with kids too, you know, so that they have an understanding. I don't know that's going to motivate them, but, um, you know, especially I mean, you could, my, sorry, I'm go sorry. Ahead. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could, you know, with what Dr. Lamb was talking about is, you know, what if, you know, he could get an 80 is just make a deal with the student and be like, you know what, if you work your butt off and you submit this reassignment and like it is like between a 95 and 100 on the quality of the work you did, you know, I'm going to give you, you know, you know, that 80 or that 85 or whatever percentage of the points they would have got. And then they would see, you know, if I would have done this originally and did the work that I needed to, and I know that I can do, that I could have got this grade, but because of the decision I made, it, it's, it's going to be lower. But, you know, make, you know, to ensure that the quality of the work is there, you know, it's like, hey, if you turn in something that's just half done, you know, you're, you're going to get that 50. Um, the quality is going to be low, but if you work really hard and submit something that I'm going, wow, I, you know, I could put this on the wall. Like this is, you know, huge quality work, you know, I'm going to meet you, you know, and get, you know, give you some more points there because the quality was there. I think it helps to know the child because for some children, it's more of a punishment to do the work than it is for the 50. Like some kids would just be like, Oh, give me the 50 because they don't want to do the work. And I think maybe that you could also add on to that, you know, 80 or 85, if it's quality work, that, you know, he doesn't take the field until the project is complete. You know, like, I mean, that could be, that could be a, like the deal breaker. So you don't take the field until you're done with this project and it needs to be up to par. Mm. That's double jeopardy. That's punishing him twice for the same thing. Are you allowed to do that? Well, I'm going to give you the higher grade. I'm going to, like, I'm really trying to bribe him. <laughs> <laughs> now, according to the code of conduct that we looked at last week, we can have him redo it for a partial credit, but we can also do a consequence as well. Now, it doesn't say anything in there about athletic participation, but this is a level one offense and we can go all the way up to an in-school suspension that can be or an out-of-school suspension we could do a carrot and stick the carrot is is if you redo this you can make up to an 80 the stick could be if you don't you get the 50 and you get a day or or whatever the the handbook says that you can assign as a consequence for dishonesty for cheating um what about that notion? Sounds like a good one. If you, you know, you had that kind of flexibility for it um, with the policy too. Well, we talked last week that you can't punish your way to good behavior, nor can you just simply reward your way. That if you're a pragmatist, that you, you have a carrot and stick, positive and negative. The handbook allows for that. The handbook allows for redoing the assignment for a lesser grade and also allows for there to be a consequence. So that's something to think about. Let me ask you a bigger question. Who assigns grades in a school? The principal. There you go. <clears throat> And I was thinking the ISS or OSS day of will also eliminate them without having to put the coaches on the line with that parent for the financial contributions for whatever that's paying for. That kind of mm -hmm. takes the, the coach out of it. And because if you're ISS or OSS for a day, you can't participate in practice or games. Yeah, I mean, how would you feel if you were the coach in this situation and you had to carry the weight for this? You got thrown under the bus. How would that make you feel as the coach? I'd be pretty disappointed in my star player. <laughs> I guess if that's, you know, if it's going to cost the team um, 
I mean, if it has repercussions for the team as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to think that coaches are good people that would go along, but I, I'm too much of a realist to know that coaches are about winning. That's what we hire them for. We can claim it's about student development, but coaches are about winning. So that may not be the, the best tack to take, but I digress. All right, continue on. All right, the last two ethical paradigms that we talked about were critique, which deals with the power and privilege. And I feel like we focused a lot on the teacher because of the, the grading policy and how it just, it doesn't go along with the policy. So in this case, the teacher was practicing unfair power by setting an unrealistic grading policy. Um, so only the students who performed very well on this um, assignment benefited from the policy, obviously. Um, we could have had like a student who performed fairly on the, on the project and because it's worth over 50% of their final grade, that, that still could have hurt them when it should have helped them because they, they still did pretty well on it. So students who struggled could have possibly failed because of this one and only assignment, which is what we've talked about. Um, adjusting the grading policy will allow all students an equal and fair chance at succeeding the class. And that's it's this grading policy I feel is, um, or that that's what we talked about a lot, that it just, it's not fair for this one assignment to, over, be the overarching decision of whether you're going to pass or fail or whether this child has to go to summer school and all these other repercussions just because of this one incident. And then profession, the final one, the act of doing what is in the best interest of the student while still upholding the rules and policies set forth by the school and the county. Um, so the decisions that are made need to hold everybody accountable for their actions in this situation. Um, the student owned up to his mistakes, he owned up to the cheating. Um, the decisions that the decisions need to help the teacher and the student become self-aware of the choices that were made prior to this incident. So the teacher um, set a grading policy that was against guidelines. So helping them realize that that is against guidelines and how we can fix it. And then the student um, choosing to cheat and they have to deal with the consequences, even though they owned up to it, like I think Jamie said, he owned up to it, he did what was right, but he's still gotta pay the, pay the price for what he did. Um, so initiating a conversation with the student, we've already said this several times, just commending them on being honest, but being really transparent about the cheating and about the consequences that are, that are gonna come from it. Whether that be like what we said before, you're gonna take a lower grade, you still have to complete it, you may miss a game because you're gonna be sitting in ISS or OSS. Um, just being transparent and equality are two of the, the most important things in this. And that's what we had. They didn't tell us what, why he cheated. That'd be interesting to know. Like what was his motivation for doing it? You know, he said that he was busy with baseball. That was, that was the one thing, but I feel like there's an underlying something mm -hmm. there. Right. Always... Right. So anyway, I guess, and not that that, excuses it by any means but I guess I think of those kind of things like I don't know I always ask kids why did you do something just to help understand why they it doesn't make it right or wrong but it helps you kind of understand what they're thinking was you know behind it um like did he even know the policy I, I don't know it was just we we talked about that it was interesting like why did he do that they didn't tell us So we had, we had the cast of characters. So we had Bobby and we had the teacher and I guess the coach would be involved in some way. You had the dad who we really didn't talk a whole lot about, but we will before we're through. What about the principal? Any thoughts about what the principal may have done, did do, didn't do. Well, you would like to think she, or is it, was it a she, he or she, whichever it was, would have known um, kind of what's going on anyway. And we were saying like, I'm not the high school, but I know our high school, they all have to turn in their syllabus to be approved um, to the principal. So, you know, if that was in that teacher's grading policy, you would kind of think maybe the principal would already know that if they were a little more involved perhaps 
Is that a stretch? <laughs> Do you think it's a policy issue that the, the teacher didn't know the policy or this was her policy and it just hadn't been discovered? I don't know. That'd be two different issues. I need to stop talking. It's not, I'm taking over, but I mean, if she knew the policy and just did it anyway, that's um, <laughs> not good. But if she didn't know the policy, well, then that's not good that the principal hadn't really talked about that either. You know, either what's, way, it's not good. What's the probability that she didn't know the policy that you couldn't, hmm. that you couldn't make a class assignment be worth twice as much as a state exam? What's, I mean, if you're what's, doing your part at the beginning of the year and, you know, going through that handbook with the teachers and pointing out those, you know, with all your training before school starts, you know, you're ensuring that everybody's on the same page and um, you point out those, those issues that can come up. I, mean, I feel like I'm going to be a negative Nancy, but what if she, what if that wasn't the original weight of the project and she made it weighted that much after she found <laughs> out he cheated? I knew I like I like Mallory for some reason. <laughs> See, Mallory's on my she's on, she's on my team. Yeah. I, I feel like I mean it's almost like vindictive on the teacher's part. They could have been like, hey, look at this big athlete. I'm gonna I'm gonna prove a point with this one right here and make sure nobody does this again or something like that. Well, I fully acknowledge that Bobby's probably a turd. That's probably not a clinical diagnosis, but that's probably accurate. Uh, pardon my language. I freely admit that Bobby probably is. And this is, and we talk about power and privilege. Uh, obviously, Bobby has power and privilege. The case went into great lengths to define that, even to the point where the superintendent spoke to the principal about this case because of Bobby's family's power and privilege. And so the probability that the teacher didn't know that she couldn't do this or that this was against the policy is pretty much zero. And the telltale was she ran to her union rep as soon as she assigned the grade to try to pressure the principal to uphold that, that grade. And so this is, this is a lot about power and privilege, about the politics not only of the people, the, the stakeholders outside, but also on the inside. Mallory, would you say this is a power play by the teacher? I would definitely say it's a power play by the teacher. Because, like you said, Bobby's a turd. She has to deal with him every single day. She probably hears from the parent if he gets below, I mean, Obviously, I've had, I'm a high school teacher, so I've, yes. I've experienced this personally. Um, you have this, you have a student who gets below a 93 on something, you're getting a phone call when normally that grade would be praised. Um, so you have to be really careful and you have to tiptoe. The one time they step out of bounds, if this teacher is over it, they're going to, they're going to, um, sorry, they're going to be. She took her chance and she ran with it. Yeah, I mean, this is this is your shot for retribution for all the times that the parents have complained, you know, about every grade and Bobby's shot at a scholarship and Bobby's a baseball player. Does that matter on scholarship when it comes to baseball? Yes. Do baseball players get full scholarships to college? No. What's the most a baseball player can get? A half. Like yeah. What's the other half have to be? It has to be academic. academic. I was going to say Will's roommate at Wake was on a full ride and he played baseball, but I didn't realize the other part was academic. I was like, yeah, it's a full ride. Always, <laughs> always. It can be a free ride. It, 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 baseball gets, I think, nine total scholarships. Nine. And, and they can split them any way they want to. They typically split them up partial. Over a lot of different things. Rather than yeah. one guy, whole thing. But that, the scholarship's really not the the big thing here. I I want somebody, since since Dale has uh, done his clinical observation and Mallory has confirmed that Bobby is a turd. I want somebody, and I'm pretty good at determining turds too. But I want somebody to read to me in this case study where it says that Bobby's a turd. 
because when we started this conversation, y'all were all lovey-dovey to Bobby. He was remorseful. <laughs> he was, we are going to be forgiving. And now all of a sudden he's a turd. Let's stick it to him. Oh, it's probably Anna. I didn't think right away that he was one. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That's why I was saying. And I, I guess that's part that we don't know, you know. He may be a good kid. He may well, be a well, good kid, but it's he's a turd. But it sound, you know, and so I'm just kind of like, is this a small town, small district? You know, you've got the other family member that's coming into play. That's typically a small town feel that would never happen in big, big district, right? So you have this small town, this this uncle, you know, whoever's coming in to kind of go to bat for him. Uh, no pun intended. <laughs> but good. yeah, that thank you. Good. That's like my one for the whole month. I'm not good with being witty. So, um, you know, and if he knows that. If he knows he's got that kind of in his back pocket, then a lot of kids will take that as this is my ride. I'm going to go ahead and push, push all the way to that edge that I can go to because I know that I've got that that family member that's pretty strong with the school board. So, and I was thinking too, like even our discussion now. That's why we have to have our policies because all the conjecture and you know the things that we put in and our thought process about it can determine which way something goes for one particular kid versus another kid. So this is why to me, policies have to be enforced and like the teacher has to know. So you can't say, you can't claim ignorance. This is the way this is done. This is the policy. This is what we do. No matter who your family is, no matter who you are, whether I like you or not, it has nothing to do with that. And to go on from that, Tiffany, a lot of uh, my husband teaches high school, they had to turn in their syllabus before school started. So if you do that, you turn that into admin, then you can't go back and say, you know, that that teacher was, you know, casting more weight just because of this happened towards that student. So that's a good safeguard to do as well. But speaking of the syllabus, I'm just curious because I make my students and their parents sign my course syllabus. Did they know how much that project was going to be worth? Because then I always go back and I'm like, whoa, 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 you knew that this particular section of assignments was worth 20% of your grade. And so I wonder if they actually knew that the percentages were so high. And with that, we could get into the fact that I know in my classroom, and I'm sure many of the rest of you who are in the classroom do the same thing. When a big assignment's coming up, we consistently remind the students, this is worth this percent of your grade, or this is this bit of an assignment. So, there's a, I imagine he probably knew how much it was worth if she was being honest. I just want to add that the probability of him being a turd is a lot higher for me with the fact that he admitted that he did it kind of like, yeah, I did it, you know, like, because he knew he had the people in his back pocket. So no, I can't read for you <laughs> in the case study that says that, but now that we think about it because well it's not my turn yet so i'll wait till my no, turn go, go right ahead well we talked about it in our group about how you know he probably was and the teacher that was her way she probably been waiting all year to just say i'm gonna get him i'm gonna get him i'm gonna get him and then up oh, i got him and so now's her chance to get him or on the flip side of that she had dealt with other athletes who had gotten away with it. And now this was her chance to get anybody. So there's a possibility that he was. And then there's a possibility that him just being an athlete made him a target. But on the other side of that, like, I know that as an administrator, you need your teachers on your side. And so you have, there's a thin line to where sometimes you have to overstep that bound and then, but really you want it to be the teacher's idea. So you don't look like you just completely undermined the teacher. And, but I mean, I know even in my school, I know that there are teachers that if the principal came to me and said, well, we need to look at your, your grading policy. If there was nothing in the district policy that said you couldn't have certain percentages or whatever, 
that teacher is going to, even when they're wrong, they are going to stand there and they're going to fight tooth and nail because that was my policy. They knew it was my policy, blah, 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 blah. So I know that there are, it, there's a fine line and you don't want to lose that respect, but I'm just wondering if she's that teacher that is very adamant about this is my grading policy. This is how it stands. Yeah, but if it if it goes against what you've said in that um, student handbook, and you're going against that, I mean, you the teacher's grading policy can't supersede what the school is saying is supposed to happen. You know, whether Bobby's a turd or he's you know sings tenor in the church choir, like you still got to give him due process and make sure that you are ho holding him accountable. You can't just take, you know, uh, you know the teacher if she if she is doing this to get back at him she's taking this personally you know and you got to take that, that the personal side out of it and you got to see what the facts are and do what you're supposed to do you know whether you like the kid or not you you can't set up a situation that you give that kid a bigger punishment because you don't like them mm -hmm. and let that come back you know when it comes to the equity piece of treating all students fairly what what did we call that last week arbitrary Remember me and you were out back smoking and, and yeah. you, you, you're a good kid, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the turd. And so you shoot me and send you back to class. That's what we're talking about. Even if Bobby is a turd, even if he's not a good kid, every kid deserves the same and everybody, and we have to go through due process with everybody. That's not an excuse for the teacher to, to arbitrarily do this to Bobby. What about the standard of capricious? Is if you fail a kid for the year, is that not the same as a one year exclusion? Would that be considered a one year exclusion from school? Would you not have to do a, a an exclusionary hearing on Bobby? If you didn't do that, would that be considered an illegal zero tolerance expulsion? Yes. And so, but think about it. A kid cheats on one class assignment and he gets excluded for a year. Does that seem like too much punishment to you? That's about like shooting me for smoking out behind the gym. That's a little excessive. So again, those standards of arbitrary and capricious come back in and they aren't simply standards written in. This is the personification. Bobby is the personification of these standards. We have to make sure that we're not being arbitrary and that we're not being capricious. And if we can't just do a, a whole year, even <clears throat> a, a zero tolerance expulsion is illegal. Even if you offer an alternative like summer school, doesn't matter. It's still an illegal zero tolerance exclusion under the Office of Civil Rights. Now we're getting into his civil rights have been violated and the 14th Amendment equal, equal protection under the law. Now all of a sudden we've taken something, we violated state policy. State policy says you can't count assignment more than 15% of the grade class assignments. We violated the state policy. We violated our local code of conduct policy. Now we violated federal law, Office of Civil Rights by doing a zero tolerance expulsion on Bobby. So the question is, is do we always support teachers? You know, the question comes for school administrators, you wanna support your teachers, but in a case where you're gonna violate federal law, state law and local board policy, can you support your teacher? Well, especially if she just did it knowing it was wrong anyway, right? That's, uh, I mean, that's like, mm -hmm. that's bad too. She knew what it was and like, I don't care. I'm gonna do what I want to anyway. Just like um, you were saying, you know, we have to, the policy is the policy for all students. Well, the policy is the policy for all teachers too. Right. Exactly. Well, I would ask the, uh, I would ask the teacher, you know, if that conversation did happen where you're behind closed doors and you're like, Hey, I mean, was this something you did? Cause you've been having issues. Now tell me what you did when you started having issues, where the documentation of you calling home or emailing or, you know, there should be some type of paper trail if this was a thing where the teacher's just fat up with the kid, you know. All right, so tell me about that critical conversation. 
that you would have with the teacher? I, I would get the teacher to have an opportunity to tell me why they think that, um, for one, that assignment is that important to be weighted that much to, you know, make or break a student. Um, I would remind the teacher, you know, that it, it goes against what our policy is. Um, I would, you know, you know, hopefully you've built some trust in the school where they could open up to you and tell you, hey, I just, you know, I just had it with this kid and, you know, be able to tell that teacher, you know, maybe some re research based strategies or what, 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 what can you do to help fix that situation? Because you're taking this personally in this situation. So, um, I don't know. It's, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm probably going to lose this quality over time, but I, I'm more of the caring when it comes to the four paradigms is just like, you know, I don't, I don't know this teacher. We're just assuming a lot of stuff in this case study, but you know, it's treating, treating your people as valuable resources in the school. So like if this teacher's truly struggling to the point where they're about to like get into some serious trouble because they're doing this is like making sure that you're giving them all the resources and tools that they need to help, you know, structure this situation in a way it doesn't have to go down this way. Well, it's a good opportunity to talk to her about the point of grades. Am I, yeah, I'm unmuted. Uh, you know, I mean, that's a perfect time to have that conversation to build that understanding of what are grades really for. Mm -hmm. But, and I'm gonna pick on Kevin here, and, and please don't take this personally, but when you wanted to engage in this conversation with me, and what if I, the teacher said back to you, I've been teaching here for 30 years, you, you, you know, you, you just got here yesterday or last week, uh, because I said so. That's why I gave this grade. Who are you to question me? Where do we go from there? That's when you, you pull out the student handbook and say, well, what you're doing, it doesn't follow our rules and policies here. So whether you've been here a day or you've been here 30 years, like we have these in place and all teachers have to make sure we're consistent um, with the policy. So it, it, it'd go to that more like, okay, we're going to be playing by the rules and making sure that, you know, it's not a, you know, it's not that I dislike you and, you know, you can, you know, say that and make me feel in a situation where like you're trying to use seniority in the school on me, you know, at the end of the day is we got to follow the rules and the policies. Well, and we well, have a um, faculty handbook, right? That would be the place where the, the teacher signs that and like you're, if you're not, I mean, that's insubordination. You're just not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know, you'd have the faculty handbook as well. Well, I think Kevin hit the nail on the head. You, you're going to have to fall back on these are the policies and not take it personally. You as the administrator are not going to have to take it personally because the teacher may come at you then. And, and that's that part of, you know, we, we try to treat everybody equitably. We can't treat everybody the same. But you're right, your, your, your people are, are most important in this organization. But if some people are not going to follow along, we have to, we, we can't take it personally. Um, and, and we have to remind them of, of why we're there and what the policies are. Steve, also, I see you just, you just want to say, I, we got we to let Steve weigh in here. What, what what's what's that little spurt? What what's on your mind? You know, I'm I'm sitting here. It, it, we we've we've trashed the teacher and we've trashed Bobby. Yeah. And and not that they probably don't deserve it, but I still go back to the principal. Did the principal do anything wrong? I'm not going to answer that. Somebody else has to. Did the principal do anything wrong? It's gone. I don't know if I'm right and my two year old sitting right here, so it's probably going to be loud. But he. Did he not Mommy, I, stop the out like the, the outsiders and the the stakeholders and the like? Why did it get all the way to the superintendent before 
something happened or before he had more information. I, I get it. I get that it's a small town. Yeah. I, I can't remember who said that. It's a, it's probably a small town. Um, but he should have had the full story before it got that far. Didn't he call the superintendent? Wasn't he the one who took it to the superintendent? Yes, and I was also going to say that even if he wasn't, if my uncle's on the school board and I'm sitting at the table telling my mom that I cheated, on a test and the teacher's gonna give me a zero and I won't get to play baseball, my mom's next move would probably be to call my uncle and say, can you do anything about this? So I don't know that, I'm not disputing you, Mallory. I'm just saying like, I'm just playing the other side of it. Like we don't even know that the principal was even given enough time to get like the full story based on the fact that a family member had a little bit of power and privilege. I don't know. But I do agree with you that, you know, he may or may not have had the full story. But I don't know. It, there, there are a couple of things that, that intrigue me about this. We'll get into the, the uncle in another conversation. The, the, the principal, I don't know how big the high school is, but one of the things that, that is curious to me, how, how did the principal find out about this problem? Wasn't it the what's, dean? What's the trigger? Is the trigger that the kid got a zero? No. The teacher told, the teacher went to him with her union rep. The right. dean of students. Um, is the one that told him the so, principal and i'm gonna bet just knowing high school culture and many of you are in high school the the triggering mechanism is bobby is a baseball player. bobby is a star and we could we could just as easily pick on kelsey that is it's the it's the star actor or actress that, that this person stands out in a crowd. And I wonder if this would even be an issue, if it would have ever percolated to the top, if this was some wallflower kid whose parent didn't give a rip. We never hear about it. We're hearing about it because this is a star in your school. So I worry that we, or letting the principal off too easy. This principal, unless it is a, a 3,000 student high school, there ought to be conduits, it seems to me, that you would hear kids talking about, I'm working on this project, and it counts this. That, that somebody is talking somewhere that you hear about it, unless you're just sitting on your can in your office and not getting out and mingling with students and others in the school. So whether it is taking up these lesson plans or syllabi at the beginning of the year and seeing how grades are structured or listening to what kids are saying one way or another, I think this principal got too comfortable not caring what teachers are doing and what students are doing in the class. And, and we, can, we, we will have other case studies, we'll have other conversations. This even goes back to what we talk about of teacher tenure is not a teacher problem, it is an administrator problem because we do not observe and evaluate properly. We ought to know what is going on. Even as slammed as our days are, we ought to know what is going on. This principle clearly, to me, didn't know it. So if the, the villain in this story, to me, is as much the principal as it is the teacher and Bob. Because I think you lay down on the job. So that's what I was squirming about, Dale. I, 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 I think, I think <laughs> that you, you've got to know what is going on. 
And, and I think that is what Dale has preached in this, in this semester and, and me to a lesser extent. But, and, and, and honestly, that's the fun part of the job. The worst part of the job is when you're holed up in your office and you're not able to get out and about. When you're able to mingle with kids and say, tell me what you're doing in such and such a class, you would know this. The joy of the day is at lunchtime or break time or before school. I mean, that's, that's the fun part. You don't think Bobby, the star baseball player, doesn't go out to baseball practice and complain about this huge project that he's got to do? Everybody ought to know that it's a problem. So we've got to get our heads out of the sand there. I think that that's a, a, a major issue with that. So. And our last case study is going to, going to, again, our first and last, we're going to revisit this again about what's the principal doing? How, how did this happen in your school? Um, now, I'll tell you one of my secrets. Well, it's not a secret. Um, this tells you how dumb I am. When I was a high school principal, I made myself senior class advisor. So I knew everything was going on with those seniors because I was going to have to do recommendations and we were looking at scholarships and we were looking at all kinds of things. And I knew everything. I knew what their senior English project was. Uh, I, I, knew, I knew all of those kinds of things. We had a graduation project back in those days that they had to do. I knew what all of them, I advised on some of those. How could you not know this was happening in your building? So, we freely admit that Bobby's probably, you know, not the best, you know, is not the easiest to deal with. We know that his parents are more concerned about him getting that athletic scholarship. And we're probably, <clears throat> you know, those kinds of things. And the teacher, she obviously knows what she's doing. She knows what, it, more than likely, that she's manipulating the grading scale, like you say, to get back at Bobby. But where's the principal in all this? I mean, this is kind of like, um, what's the old joke? Some people uh, know what's happening. Other people, you know, what happened? This is a case of what happened. You know, th this principal came in one morning, as we used to say in the business, and his, and his pants were up the flagpole. Everybody in, everybody in the building knew but him. Um, how does that happen? Well, it's real simple. And Steve's heard my argument on this before. Everybody has a hide, H-I-D-E, and not, not your skin. Everybody has a place to hide as an administrator to deal with things that they don't want to deal with. Now, you folks being instructional people, y'all hide in the classroom. Uh, you're in there all the time, and, you, you know, you can't come out for the irate parent or to deal with things like that. I was an operations person. I'll be the first to tell you. I'd hide in the lunchroom, ball field, down in the gym places like that. We, we tend to, to find a way to hide where we look like we're doing something, but we, we're not dealing with the things that we need to deal with or we find unpleasant. Dealing with teachers like this sometimes is unpleasant. Um, you know that as well as I do, especially that battle ax English teacher in high school that does the annual every year or runs the prom that thinks her name's on the deed rather than just the door. Uh, those people are hard to deal with. And so what we do is we check out, we hide. We don't know what's going on in the building. Um, this is a pretty legalistic, easy case. You can't do what she did. You do have recourse. He can redo the work for a lesser grade. The carrot, that's the carrot. The stick is you can give him up to, I believe it's one day out of school suspension for dishonesty, so you can manipulate that to get Bobby to do the right thing. We know the principal assigns a grade. The teacher can't legally do this. We know those pieces, but the question that Steve's posing is, is, is also very valid. Where was the principal in doing all this? How did this thing get, get to the superintendent before he'd already, he should have already dealt with this long before it got to the superintendent. If you knew what was going on in your building. So the legal part of this is pretty, is pretty easy. Now, the, 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 the ethical paradigms, the ethical profession, that, that's for, for the principal as well. I mean, that, that's what we're talking about here. 
the ethic of profession. Were you doing your job? If you're not doing your job, it's hard to uphold the, the you know, critique, <clears throat> justice, um, the other ethical care, the other three ethical paradigms, if you're not upholding the ethic of profession, that you show up sober and clean clothes and do your job every day. You're not just the parts that you like. That that's that's the toughest piece. That's the toughest piece. All right. So we're moving on to our next group. Thank you, Kevin. That was, those of you who have to go. Um, who's going to be next on the hit parade here? Pam, you're going to, I'm going to share my, you, you're going to be the host then. I've got it. Me and Kelsey are next. See you guys next week. All right. Thank you. Dr. Lamb, while they're setting up, I have a question. Yes. Um, you know how you just talked to Kevin about speaking to the teacher and how she was kind of bucking him on the policy. Mm -hmm. Would it, should an administrator document that, that you have had this discussion about Absolutely. policy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just like you document every discipline case with a student, you docu document every interaction with a teacher, especially when it's going to be a negative interaction like this. Absolutely. You know, that's just like when you're doing due process, you know, when, when you put your, your response into the discussion board, I told you it's the best practice to get written statements to document everything when you're doing due process. Same with teachers. Get written statements, document everything. Um, absolutely. Documentation is what will save you in the long run. Absolutely. That's a great point, Tiffany. Absolutely. This is not going to be an ex parte uh, hey, we're friends conversation with the teacher in a case like this. This, this is going to have to be a, uh, this is going to have to be what we call a critical conversation or what Ron Thompson used to refer to as a come to Jesus meeting. All right, ladies, Pam and Kelsey. All right. Can you guys see the screen? Yes. All right, so for case study one, do you want me to talk more about what happened with Bobby or do you think we've covered that enough? We've covered that. Okay, I thought so, good. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> All right, so for the discussion questions, what should the principal's course of action be? Be sure to address the issues of due process, substantive and procedural, and the standards of arbitrary and capricious. So the principal's course of action in general, the principal should enforce district policies regarding cheating, sit and listen to all stakeholders in the issue. That includes Bobby and Bobby's parents, the dean of students who came to him with the problem, Jane, the teacher, and if Jane so chooses, since she's already involved the union representative, she should have Molly Scott there as well. Um, he should, as the principal, Tim should meet with the baseball coaches and potentially look at the practice schedules and the policies for academic participation and see what may have motivated Bobby to actually cheat in this situation. And of course, keep the superintendent informed throughout the entire process. Okay, for substantive and procedural, um, make sure that the teacher's grading policies are fair and aligned with district standards and school standards and policies and procedures that are set in place in the student and teacher handbooks. And for procedural, um, make sure every party, and this is a little different since Bobby admitted to um, plagiarizing for using his brother's paper, not making any changes to it, but um, making sure everyone has a chance to contribute their, um, um, their perception, their viewpoint um, before making a, a conclusive decision. So next we're gonna talk about um, arbitrary versus capricious. So the school, and Tim, the principal, have to ensure fairness and equity. That's their jobs. That's providing due process. Um, and so regardless of the student population, whether they be an athlete or a drama kid, whether they be popular and um, are good at math or not, they have to 
be fair and equitable across the board based on the code of conduct that should already be established. Bobby, in this case, has admitted to copying his brother's work. Um, and it mentions within the case study that both he and his mom had signed the handbook saying that they understood the consequences laid out within the handbook of that code of conduct. However, like we've already talked about, we don't know if they also signed off on that particular teacher's syllabus, but the handbook could potentially have that information about grade percentages. It could be laid out as a school policy instead of individual teacher policies in that case. It is. That's a requirement. And Tim should also ensure that um, the teacher's grading policy and her punishment aligns with site and district policies um, that are mandated and standard across the board in all situations. Um, so as we talked about meeting with Jane and having that conversation if need be, or having already looked at it ahead of time um, by looking at her syllabus or um, having a hand within the school situation. Okay, so um, address the four ethical paradigms as they relate or not to this case. And these can be found in the document, the role of the principal above and is in the materials folder on the main menu. So the four ethical paradigms we're looking at, as you guys know, are justice, care, critique, and profession. So for justice, it is Tim's job to make sure that the policies are fair and equi equitable. We've issued and said that so many times already in our presentation because ultimately that's his job as school administrator is to make sure things are being followed and everything is fair are equal, not equal, equitable for everyone, and that all parties are following it in the same manner. He should also um, review the assignment um, and ensure that Bobby plagiarized. Now, of course, Bobby already admitted to doing this, so in this case, the step can be skipped, but if it were an issue where Bobby wasn't quite admitting that he actually did plagiarize, Tim may need to be involved in that revision <coughs> process to um, give fair due process to the student to ensure that he had actually cheated on the assignment. And Tim must also ensure that the district grading policies are being followed and making sure that the assignment is weighted appropriately. He needs to uh, look at the teacher's policies to make sure that they're aligned with district and school policies and help her in adjusting them if they're not. Now, assumedly, um, if he had his hands in the pot, so to speak. He would have already known that they were not fitting to the school and district policies and would have already worked to adjust them before this problem arose. But however, as we've discussed, he has not done that. Um, Jane acted on reasonable suspicion when she reviewed the assignment and thought it looked similar to something she'd seen previously. And when asked, Bobby admitted to plagiarism. Probable cause um, is defined by, um, I found a nice definition on Maricopa County, that it's a reasonable person will believe that a crime is in the process of being committed, had been committed, or was being committed. And in this case, obviously it's a school setting. It's not so much a crime, but plagiarism is the crime and it's cheating, which might as well be a crime in the school setting. <laughs> okay, for care, which is loyalty, concern, um, the every stakeholder, um, the teacher, um, curriculum person, principal, should take the time to understand why he has cheated, he has used his brother's paper rather than creating his own and not rush to make a decision um, that is, like y'all said, je double jeopardy. There's no reason to, um, punish him for more than should be. You can't completely fail him because of one assignment. And even though plagiarism can, I mean, I, I feel like he's in high school and I feel like, um, you know, the importance of plagiarism needs to be expressed to all students, especially this one who has committed plagiarism because in college you can get 
get terminated. You can get kicked out of school. So I don't feel like it should be something that should just go, oh, Bobby, you can't do that. It, it, needs, to, it needs to be something important. He needs to have this burned in his brain that, uh, of why he just can't plagiarize. Um, establishing prior relationships with all stakeholders um, will help um, develop an understanding of how policies are enforced and um, for to a lot to establish um, Tim's um, understanding of why these policies are important and why they can't just be skipped over for him because if it comes down to another star football player, star basketball player, um, committing the same type of offense, you need to make sure you establish the importance of this, of plagiarism or, or upholding uh, school policies so that, so that parents don't get mad and bicker back and forth with, well, your kid got away with this, why can't my kid? That's just not fair across the board. And plagiarism keeps students from learning. Um, by him using a document that was created by a different person, he missed out on learning, improving uh, writing skills, learning concepts. Um, it cheats him out of the knowledge uh, and the ability to, if this is a state, I'm, I'm not sure if it even said, but if this is a state um, tested subject, it cheats the school uh, out of their test scores. It cheats the teachers out of their test scores. Um, if they if they have the EVOSH reporting like we do, I mean, it just if you're if they're not willing to do their part, it looks bad on us, and that can impact our um, teacher evaluation. I mean, bonuses in some in some subjects. So it's just important for teachers and students and parents to understand the importance of um, student, student achievement. Looking at now, um, it would show corrupted morals if Tim did allow Bobby's uncle's status on the school board and his financial contributions to the school to impact the decision and potentially even the punishment, uh, because at that point he is showing bias to Bobby based on his uncle's status and um, treating Bobby in a different manner than he would um, peers who may plagiarize but don't have that extra incentive there for the school. Uh, and Tim should also ensure when he publishes the handbook and puts it out, that the policies are ethical and moral before they even hit the ground. Um, it is his responsibility and the school staff's responsibility to make sure that they're all applying the policies in the appropriate manner to the student. So if it's laid out in a code of conduct format, that they are keeping track of how many offenses, is this the first offense of plagiarism? Or is this the fifth offense and now it should be a suspension? Um, However, it's laid out within the handbook, they need to make sure that it's applicable and um, actually being utilized the way it was intended. Similarly, um, Tim, when working with all of the various stakeholders, can't um, choose one particular side over the other um, within the elements of due process of giving everyone their fair side of the story that's involved, but also within following the pre-written procedures, which if he were to say, well, you know, Bobby, your uncle gave us um, $20,000 this year to the baseball team for new uniforms, then, well, we'll let this one slide. Um, he's giving in to Bobby's uncle's side of things and ultimately Bobby at that point and being unfair to the teacher and the rest of the school. Um, he has to ma also make sure that the incident, in this case, matches the punishment following that code of conduct. And as I mentioned, should before, needs to check previous offenses and review the team's practice schedule, um, making adjustments as needed. Because by looking at that team's practice schedule, it may help him to better understand 
Bobby's reasoning um, because Bobby stated in the case study that he um, plagiarized because he just didn't have time to do the homework because he was at practice, which I'm sure he was. Um, sports and arts tend to spend long hours working um, in performance or sports season, but there also has to be an understanding that academics come first in situations like this and, um, and making sure there's not too much focus on the practice side of things and no focus on the academic side. Okay, so for profession, which is basically accountability, which we all have um, or must adhere to, allowing him to get by with cheating is not setting him up for success. And that can impact him as far as, um, like we said before, um, playing baseball in a college setting, it could, um, it could remove the right for him to play on the team, to receive the academic scholarships he might need. If you're going to a, a, um, a private university, especially those can be a little pricey, um, making decisions based on the influence of Bobby's relatives is not moral because it's not, it's not fair. It's not fair to the rest of the students for um, their influence or their money to impact. Um, you're not supposed to buy grades. You're not supposed to buy places on the team, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And um, we don't want him to set him up, set himself up for mm -hmm. judgment with a, uh, from other parents. If um, if a school board family, a school school board member members family member um, is exempt from policies, why do you have the policy? Okay, um, we think it's better to to not take into consideration the financial contributions or to risk losing those um, than to have to deal with different parents and different stakeholders um, or other members on other sporting teams. And um, when you hold a student uh, academically accountable, um, academically and socially accountable, um, you're just setting everybody up for, you're setting your standard. And that's super important because you don't want to have different standards. You can't have different standards for different kids or different socioeconomic level kids. In addition to what you said, ethics of the profession are is that you don't, is that you don't allow Bobby to be, uh, you don't allow Bobby off the hook, but you don't allow him to be made an example of either. We have to make sure that we understand that that ethic of profession cuts both ways. Now, to Steve's point, and I'm, I, I, he can speak for himself, but to Steve's point, his 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 premise tonight is is that the principal is not following through with. <clears throat> procedural due process. What does that mean? We got all these policies over here. How is it that Bobby, because Bobby's a star, he's come to our attention that he's getting the shaft on the, uh, on the procedural due process, but other students aren't. What if they, what if they aren't stars? So the point that, that has to be made an ethic of profession is this. If you're not out there seeing what due process is being delivered to your students, how do you know that everybody's getting an equitable shape? We, 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 this is an example of the policy says you get this, but Bobby, he, he's a star and didn't get that. What about kids who aren't stars? That's the part of the ethic of profession that we've got to make sure that we get our head around is that we can't assume because we have policies in place in our handbooks or that we've covered that, that, that that's automatically what's happening day to day in our school, simply because we have that policy. Now I'm gonna hold up a piece of paper. You're just gonna have to trust me on this one. Where's Lisa? 
Uh oh, there she is. This right here. is this one's from Guilford County. And you could go to your principal and ask her, but she probably won't give it to you. But every county at the principal's annual summer conference for the principals in your district, they're given a sheet of paper. And it's the non-negotiables for your school. And what it has on there is things like whether we're going to have a block schedule or an A-B day. It's going to have the length of the day, number of hours of instruction. It's going to have how many minutes of math reading. It's going to be, it's going to be an aid for us to build our master schedule. That comes in number three. Remember, federal law first, then state, state law, then board policy. That's what we're talking about. All those policies that affect the operation of your school that coming year is on that list. Of, it says non-negotiable. You'll have this many minutes of math, this many. It also has the grading. It has the grading scale on there. Uh, it has like the quarterly assessments that you're going to do when the state exams. Gonna, it has all that stuff on there that has to be built into your master schedule, which is the heart of your faculty handbook for that year. All that stuff is given to you here you're to go back and put that in place. All this stuff is defined for you. Uh, just like when Kelsey said they should know, what, yes, they, they know what the, the grading policy is. That's part of that that's handed out every year. Because sometimes there's minor adjustments that the board makes to those things based on like, you remember when we implemented Reading 3D? 3D Reading, anybody remember that a few years back? No, crickets? <clears throat> It changed the number of minutes of instruction. It also changed the grading. Everybody knows in, the, in el early elementary, in the primary grades, you have um, M-class data doubles that all, all, they tell you everything about all that, how that factors into the yearly average. All of that is determined at the district office level. It's handed to you. It's not an issue of we don't know what the policy was. The issue is, are you getting out there? and making sure that folks are getting that procedural in, in, in procedure in, in reality. Are these policies happening? That's the ethic of profession. Uh, it's not a question of we don't know the policy or there is no policy. The issue is, is the policy being applied equitably across all students, not just for the stars? That's the ethic of profession. Very good presentation. All right, who's next? I think we are. Okay, so who's going to who's going to be the Yvonne? Who's going to be? Yvonne? I'm going to make you the host. Yes. Stop my video. Okay. Can you see my screen at all or not yet? Not yet. Okay. Share. Here we go. There we go. Okay. Okay, so um, Bianca and I are gonna talk about how we approached a case study. And so what we did at first was really to talk about what our thoughts were because we read it, we digested, you know, talked about it more so before we actually decided what we were going to do in terms of our own, our own decisions based on our task. And so to begin with, we looked at our initial thoughts to kind of get that out and open so that we were sharing how we were, how we felt about it. So one of the things that came up was just about athletes in general, sometimes getting 
away with things that other students might not necessarily get away with. And so we, we thought about that as we were coming up with our decision and how we were gonna approach the situation. Um, we definitely thought that the punishment was too excessive and really kind of were taken back at how the teacher was able to remember a specific assignment so well that was written two years ago, which kind of almost felt like she was targeting a specific student, almost like there was an agenda even before so. And we definitely believe that no grade at all should have any kind of weight in that much bearing that would actually impact the student in his senior year that had um, so many other punishments besides just the grade itself. So it just seemed like, you know, the whole idea of double jeopardy, the whole idea of this weight that was not only affecting the student, but then the whole entire baseball team, which seemed to be very rare to everybody within the community. And so we just really thought about those at first before we did anything and just kind of like hash those out and just discuss like where, what we thought just overall. Not right now. And so when we talked about our principal's course of action, what we thought was, and you know, what we thought we should do as a principal, because that's how we approached it. If we were the principal, how would we approach the situation? Um, because of the situation with the teacher and because the teacher had already shared the fact that she was gonna meet with her, you know, bring a union rep with her, we believe that it would be a wise idea to meet with a teacher and her union rep to get her perspective on the situation, to let her talk, to hear her perception, not to do any kind of any kind of judgment calls or any kind of policy talks or anything like that, but just to hear where she was coming from with everything. Um, at the same time, when we met with her, we believe that we should talk to her about the administrative perspective and logic, definitely, re you know, referring to the policy at hand, because while the policy said, um, the student would fail, it did not say that the student would get a zero. So that was something that also kind of struck us. Um, then we decided to talk with the teacher. When we were talking with the teacher to make it seem like there was a team approach, that we were approaching this as a team to help the student out more so than target the student or target the teacher or kind of you know do any kind of blaming or anything like that, because it seemed like that's kind of where the case study was going in a way. So we just talked about, having a plan on what to do next with the teacher as far as the situation went with the student. Cause we didn't feel like it was finalized because obviously it was going against policy and, and the fact that the way everything was handled. And so we talked about discussing due process, um, talking about substantive, looking at the law and policy and how it was being applied. And then talking about procedural aspects in terms of what actions would need to be done to reduce liability. Um, because we felt that this was something that could have further repercussions, not necessarily for the teacher or the school or, you know, just in general, that this not, would not be something that would just end there, that there was going to be more to it. And so we're just trying to be proactive at the point where we were at, obviously understanding that there was not a lot of preventative measures that were done beforehand because the principal should have known um, what was going on in the school, as was, as was mentioned before, um, also should have known that this policy, you know, that there were grades that were being given out that were so heavy in weight that would violate the school policy. Yeah. And so we kind of, you know, we're just really thinking about how to now proactively go, how to approach it and just move forward and really think of a solution that was going to be fair, or equitable for everybody, not necessarily for the student or just the teacher or just, just everybody in that case. And so that's how we handled the beginning part. The second part we talked about, and we kind of like flipped this around because we had first talked about meeting with the, with the parent, but we decided that it'd be better just to call the parent, just to see what they were, like what was their whole side to the story because obviously the parent knew and the parent had expressed their concern to the uncle. And so that whole knowledge and shared information was already out there. So we thought again, to be proactive, would be to call the parent to discuss the student's actions related to the assignment and then the potential outcomes that would obviously be on the plate. Um, allowing the parent to voice their opinion and also get the perspective of the student because we also felt that the student was kind of put in a situation where they were backed in their corner to almost have to admit that they did something even though we know that they did it and we knew that they were wrong but there really wasn't any, for something that weighed so much of an assignment, it just seemed like there wasn't any due process to it in reality. And so 
we also decided to discuss the administrative perspective and logic into the decisions that were being made. Again, not making any decisions yet, but just talking about the policy and how we would follow through with everything, all the steps that we would take. And then um, to really express the understanding to the parent that they would understand this, the, the school policy in terms of cheating. And obviously they knew it because they signed the form. And obviously we know that a lot of parents have signed forms that have said, you know, they understand policies, they understand cheating, and they understand all of this. But we felt like there was some, some areas that we needed to, to really like look further into in terms of just policy in general. And so the last step that we thought of, of taking would be to actually arrange a meeting with the teacher, parent, and student. Obviously at this point, hopefully at, you know, everything had kind of come to a neutral point where we could actually discuss the next action. And we really felt that the action did not need to be a zero or failing grade for the assignment. And we also felt that there should be some restorative action made where the student should learn why, um, not really why, but how to prevent plagiarism, how to possibly time manage you know, better, and how to also um, give credit where credit's due. I mean, in that aspect, not really necessarily just, you know, turning something in that wasn't his own, especially because he knew it was wrong. And so that's where we went with that aspect. Um, and so that's how we approached it. So we just kind of were like open to seeing what would happen in a way, but then also at the same time having our plan. But we were really trying to be proactive more than anything and really felt that there obviously needed to be a further look into investigation into the, the school policy as it was written. So. Okay, anything else? Um, yeah, um, I think Bianca is gonna talk about the paradigms. Bianca? Yes, so for justice, we just talked about that stating and establishing the understanding that there is a policy and a consequence in right. place for plagiarism and meeting with the teacher and calling the parent or student kind of addressed the justice part of it. Um, for care, we, um, that was where we kind of talked about with the teacher, just letting her know that you hear her voice and you understand where she's coming from, giving her a chance to just talk about and get off of her chest, whatever is bothering her. Because like I said, um, earlier we did consider the fact that either Bobby was had been um, just kind of slacking all year and this was her chance to get him or she's had athletes that have gotten away um, and so this was her chance to just kind of you know let it all out and just kind of let the principal know how she was feeling. Um, we also had concern and connection with hearing the parent and student side and offering a restorative alternative building a positive relation with the relationship with the teacher and the parent or community with um you know having the uncle on the school board um collaboration and shared decision making with the teacher so just allowing the teacher to take you know have input in the decision making and um paying attention and offering support for all of the individuals involved and focus on restorative justice for the student and a learning opportunity over an immediate punishment. For critique, just a reevaluation of the policies on plagiarism, including preventive or education about plagiarism, um, and the policies that are specific to the grading policy for the course or weight. So just having her review um, how much everything weighed and um, just offering another consequence with restorative practice as opposed to just um, just condemning him. Um, and also incident or offense type in that all involved recognize the student's wrongdoing but understand the consequences will reflect the action as decided by the group. And the last one for profession, restore the practice to ensure accountability and success of the student. Um, being transparent in how the situation will be handled with the emphasis on the school policy and potential consequences. 
We also considered the potential student and legal consequences of decision making by including a restorative approach as opposed to just a punitive approach. Safeguard, we talked about ways to safeguard values of democracy, equity, equity and diversity through our approach. And we also wanted to act in the best interest of the students while ensuring individual student needs inform aspects of schooling. I think that's it. Oh, there's our references. Very good. All right. All right, who's our last group? Who's, who have we missed? Alicia? It's our group and I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, Lisa's gonna do it. There we go. Okay, um, so case study one. Um, what we did for our first slide in tackling this case study was we looked at um, the GOSH decision and we looked at the first one, the oral written notice of the charges against a student. And um, the teacher did address the issue with Bobby. Um, that's when he admitted that he did that. Um, the second was that explanation of the evidence that the authorities had to support the charges. Um, we had a couple different steps um, or like items that um, we wanted to talk about when it came to, to this um, area was that he admitted that he plagiarized the assignment. And also when Jane investigated, she was able to conclude that it was the same um, work that was done um, his brothers. And then we also had that Bobby and his mother signed a letter indicating awareness of the student handbook. So those were items that we had under that second um, um, part of the GOSH decision. And then the third was the opportunity for the student to present his or her side of the problem. So parents and Bobby met with the principal and then the parents and Bobby were part of that process. And we were saying that um, that's excluding Mr. Michaels. So just keeping it the parents. We also wanted to review the uh, grade percent, which we've all talked about that, the student handbook, the rubric, or the course syllabus, whichever one they're calling it. So when we look at um, actions of discipline, what we had said was, um, in school discipline action for up to three days, OSS allowed opportunity to redo the assignment receiving no more than 80%. When it comes to baseball, um, this was kind of a natural consequence due to kind of poor timing on his part <laughs> was that he was gonna be suspended for three days, which disqualified him to play in the next uh, um, game, which occurred on day two of the suspension. So we had said he needs to, I guess, pre-plan a little bit better. Um, and then documentation of discipline on power school in the principal's portal so that we can keep that running track of you know if this is something that is going to occur again then we have that that history noted in there so this was information that we found from guilford county student handbook um, so the example of the student handbook that was listed um, as part of the school's policy to maintain standards of personal Honesty, cheating of any kind may require a failing grade by the teacher. So that was out of our book. And then you can see down at the bottom how Guilford County Schools, how they handle this situation, that they shall not engage. So it, it really puts that clear language in there not, and it's not saying may require a failing grade. It really states in here what's gonna be, what's gonna happen. Right. And then over on the right side, we have, um, their breakdown of what's gonna happen. So they have a breakdown for elementary, middle, and high as it relates to disciplinary action. Mm -hmm. So in school, disciplinary action up to three days OSS, um, zero on the assignment, and then may be allowed opportunity to redo the assignment. Mm -hmm. So that's what is stated in their handbook. Right. Okay. 
And if y'all want to jump in, or I can. Um, I mean, and we've talked about this several times tonight that the project counted for more than half of his grade and how, I mean, according to policies that that can't happen. And when we were um, talking about doing the 80 on the assignment um, and allowing him to redo it, um, so he can't get an A. So even if this is top of the top, honors kid, always does what he's asked. We're going to assume that he is this delightful baseball player that we have <laughs> sitting in our room um, that just, I mean, ran out of time and thought, hey, I'll just take my brother's assignment because he got an A on it, um, that he couldn't get an A. But he would be allowed to remake, to redo the assignment, and it wouldn't cripple his GPA because it sounds like this kid's trying to go to college. And so um, he still has that learning experience. He's getting the content from the project. And so we kind of talked about that. But then reviewing it from the teacher's side and evaluating the grade weights and the number of assignments that actually average into that final grade. Um, so I know that somebody mentioned having to submit their course syllabus to the principal. Um, but see, in my district, I don't even think my principal knows what my grade averages are. And I mean, and it's never come up, it's not a problem because um, I use common sense and I don't have one test that's like, boom, you, you failed my class. Um, so we just kind of talked about it as a group um, and we discussed the, the different grade weights and the number of assignments. And it's, it's not fair that that one assignment just completely wipes it out. So there needed to be actions taken towards the course syllabus or the rubric. So here we have course of action based on a due process part. And we said that um, as far as substantive goes, um, basically there must be a compelling reason for the punishment. And of course, plagiarism is a substantive, substantive reason. But then with the procedural part, um, due process requires that policy and rules and regulations be carried out in a fair manner. Um, this is kind of where we feel like maybe the ball was dropped a little bit because it, procedural was with the student where we going through the due process. However, the where it went through from principal, dean of academics, all the way through, we that that due process will have to be questioned some. Um, also with the standards of arbitrary and capriciousness, well, that also, it's not black and white. It could, the arbitrary and capricious could be with the teacher, her grading um, would be a point of uh, where it's arbitrary. However, maybe the, the school policy, which should trump the teacher's policy, um, is not arbitrary and capricious. So those types of things will have to be truly looked at with um, this case with Bobby. Um, and so when we looked at justice, um, as with justice, we felt like the administration decisions were not arbitrary and capricious, the, just the overall, um, because the student did admit plagiarism. The student reviewed both documents to ensure the replication, it was actually plagiarism, and following the guidelines in the student handbook, and that the teacher is mandated to review the grading policy. So the justice there is the fairness and equity. So in, whenever a situation occurs, it has to go across it. We're not just focusing zeroing in on the student. We got to make sure fairness and equity is happening on every part, whoever's involved from the principal to the teacher. So the teachers are great in policy was not fair or equitable or appropriate. Um, and the um, justice part here will be to assess that grading, that grading um, percentage. However, that does not negate that he did plagiarize. Then we go to CARE. And with CARE, CARE is one of those things where loyalty and trust is established. Um, and the loyalty and trust, once again, I keep reiterating this, you have to think about it across loyalty and trust with, with parents and principal, principal and teacher, teacher, even teacher and student, and even with student to the student himself. Um, you have to make sure when you're thinking about CARE, think about the long-term consequences of what you're doing. When you do give a consequence, is your policy set up to actually benefit the person 
Um, is it set up to where it will be long lasting replications? I know somebody was talking about, you know, scholarships and things like that. Um, also with the relationship between the principal and superintendent and the principal as Dr. Laws kept saying to the principal and the teachers, because if the principal does not know what's going on, then that kind of indicates how can a principal have established care if they actually don't know what's going on inside a teacher's classroom as far as policies are going. And when we were looking at critique, um, it doesn't matter your social status. If you are in a small town or in a large school district, or if your mother or father is on the board of education or whatever, it doesn't matter who you are. There are processes that and guidelines that need to be followed and upheld. And so that just kind of goes back to um, what Bianca's group was talking about it there shouldn't be special consequences because they're a baseball player and I mean and we do see that with athletes sometimes well oh they're the star so we're just gonna like shove that under the rug a little bit um, so the critique was um, when the the dean of students went in there he was like we have a problem and I mean I could just see it because I'm in a small district we've got a problem and the star of our baseball team the teachers failed him and and you know his uncle Mr. Michaels is on the school board and that was their immediate concern was not that Bobby's failing the class and that the grades are worth on one assignment it was that there was that family connection to the school board and how bad it was going to look um, and then we were also looking at the discipline needs to be followed by an outline that, that was outlined in the school handbook, but it also needs to be clear and it needs to align with ethical and moral decisions. So I like how in Guilford County Schools, it is very, very outlined. I mean, there's still some, there's leeway because it said that they could redo the assignment. So it's not so cut and dry that there's not some manipulation that could happen there but that it's very clear as to what is expected to a certain degree. And then our last one was profession. And so we feel like with our decision that we made that the student would be held accountable um, for his academic decisions, but that we're not stopping him from having academic success either. Um, that we modeled the principal self-awareness reflective practices, transparency, and ethical behavior. Um, but we did discuss that, you know, a little bit that he didn't really know what was going on as far as the course syllabus. And like I said, I'm, other than the fact that I've had the principal's child in my class, which who knows if he actually read it, he signed the, the course syllabus and was like, okay, here you go. Um, and then we were just talking about legal consequences in our decision because there's always that scary, did we step over the line? Um, can we actually do that? Just because it's happened before doesn't really mean that you can do that. And then always keeping um, the student's best interest at heart as an administrator. So regardless of how we feel, and this kid might be a turd, but we still have to think about that just because that's how he acts now does not mean that we should cripple him in his academics so that we need to think for the best interest of all of our students. And that's it. Thank you. Well, the point of Bobby being a turd is what if Bobby's not? What, what, what happens is in schools, we find it easy to punish some kids and not others uh, based on their behavior, not based on, on giving every kid a shot or being equitable or it's, it's hard. I know it's easy for me to sit here and tell you not to be arbitrary or capricious. That's, that's a very hard thing. It really is. It really is. Um, it, it's, it's, it's most difficult now. My experience as a high school baseball player, as a high school baseball head coach, and as a principal of a high school baseball team is, is that 
baseball players in my era were the most competitive academically because they could only get a half scholarship. Go back to that again. And, and they would, you know, their, them and their parents were my worst, by far the worst. The basketball and football players, not nearly as bad as the baseball players. Uh, and their families, oh, their families were just, oh, they, they, they were the worst. And I can see why it would be easy to treat kids, to be hard on kids, because them and their parents are wearing you out, but you can't. So even if we acknowledge that Bobby is a turd, we still can't wear Bobby out just because he, because he is. We have, we have to be equitable. So I'm going to finish up, and then I'm, and Steve's going to talk about the politics of the situation from the superintendent level for just a few minutes. But my question to you is this. Could, this, could you continue to work with this teacher who would, would pull such a thing on a kid as this? Could you, and you don't have to answer, but I, what I, this is a rhetorical question, but what I want you to think about is somebody who would do this to a kid that's as powerful as this kid, what would they do to kids that didn't have any power that maybe were, were not likable? What, what are they, if they're doing this to, the, to the, a kid like Bobby, what are they doing to the least of us? That, that's my question that I'll pose to you tonight. All right, we kind of planned this and we've left him 10 minutes to talk about the politics of this situation. So, Dr. Laws, take us home tonight. And they're hoping it won't last 10 minutes. So, here, here's the first question. Uh, and I'll, I'll pick on the last group. So, uh, Tiffany, I'll let you answer this first. You're the principal, and Mr. Michaels calls you about Bob. Mr. Michaels being the boisterous board member, chamber of uh, commerce head. Yeah. And he calls you about Bobby. How are you gonna navigate that? Well, first of all, I cannot talk to Mr. Michaels about Bobby because he's not Bobby's parent. Dale, so, Dale, give her an A, give yeah. her a star. <laughs> Perpa, we've talked about Perpa. We can't be talking right. about Bobby. I, I'm sure all of you, process that but but i'm telling you mr michaels is going to call you tiffany isn't he yes he is yeah <laughs> so i want to hear in your sweet tone how you're <laughs> going to tell him it's none of your daggum business <laughs> i would tell him where mr michaels i'm so glad you are very involved in michael's academics and what's going on with him, but please tell his parents to give me a call. And if you would like to meet with the, me, have his parents meet with, we can all meet together. Thank you, Mr. Michaels. And when he says, do you know who I am? Which he will. Okay. And then I'm gonna go to Superintendent Jones on you. You still gonna be sweet? Yes, why not? Yeah, because my thing is, if if you're doing what you're supposed to do and you're following your policy and laws, then that should be backing you. And if I should only wonder, I should only worry if you're going to my superintendent if I mishandle something. Okay. So. All right, so Alicia, you were in the last one. So Mr. Michaels now is truly hacked at Tiffany. And he's come to su the superintendent. Baseball parents. And the superintendent gets an earful of what a bunch of no minds we have over at the school. The superintendent calls you, Alicia, and now you're the principal. Tiffany, we've already gotten Tiffany on suspension uh, because she's messed up with the board member. So you get called by the superintendent. What do you say to the superintendent? That we have to follow the law and that we can't speak with him. Okay. Because it's not his child. All right, I'll back you on that. What do you say to the superintendent about the whole situation with Bob? Um, that I am trying to handle it according to our policies and procedures. And 
I wouldn't give too much detail until I was aware because sometimes that's how you stick your foot in your mouth. So yeah, it, I am a, great. I'm a person who thinks it out before I say something. Yeah. It's a great line to say, I'm looking into it and I'll get right back with you. Now I can promise you the superintendent's going to say, I ain't got much time because he's on me, but it's, but you, you, that's another wise statement. So Tiffany gets the, gets a star and Alicia gets a star because she now has delayed the response. You don't want to fly off too quickly with this. You want to, you want to say, let me look into a couple things and, and I'm going to let you know. So you've, you've done these things. Now, what Dale was referring to is the political pressure that comes from this. And, and the school board thing's one thing. I mean, I, and, and that's, you know, you, you, every superintendent deals with school board members and, and they have agendas all their own. The bigger thing for me in this case study is that this is the president of the Chamber of Commerce. And so I want all of you to think for a second. And, and some of you are in larger districts and some of you are in smaller districts. What happens to your school district when you lose the support of the president of the Chamber of Commerce? Funded. Is it okay? You lose support through funding, through um, contributions from local businesses. If you lose the Chamber of Commerce and you've lost your key, your key constituent that's going to push county commissioners to give you more funding, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you're going to lose your conduit to other businesses that are going to fund you in, in private monies and donations. I was the director of the Chamber of Commerce in King for a couple of years. This was prior to getting into education, but I always enjoyed one reason I went into education was because I had an education committee meeting every month with all the principals and the superintendent, the assistant superintendent monthly. And it was just so interesting. I thought, well, maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe I want to be a teacher. And I kind of wish I was still back there. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Grass isn't always green. But yes, we, we help the schools out a lot. And I pushed and um, encouraged businesses gather. I got them together to let them know the needs of the school district. And I mean, it made a huge difference. So. Yeah. And Mr. Michael mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. and, and you may not have parlayed it to, to benefit certain things. I know you didn't, you, you, you wouldn't have. But, but many folks in those kind of political power situations parlay it to, to their to the benefit of the entities that they care about. So Dale, when Dale and I talked about this case, the first time we read the case, it was, it is this, this pressure that the superintendent's going to feel politically to satisfy this supporting entity. Not that you cheat to do it, but to make sure that, that, that the answer is satisfactory and that, that you can defend it. So, uh, so we've had Tiffany to understand, I'm not gonna talk to Mr. Michaels, smart move. Alicia, I'm not gonna give you too quick a response to I have all the right answers. But then it does become critical because of the nature of the support system, the, the, the political support system, that the superintendent, the principal, and, and the educators are on the same page in knowing how to resolve this. In this case, is that, is that fair that Bobby has that much clout? No, but as Dale has told us many times and we all acknowledge, there's nothing fair about life. And when it comes down to it, if we lose the Chamber of Commerce, we're not just impacting Bobby and the baseball team, we are impacting every child in our district 
And many of those children who without that support have zero chance to be successful in our district. So that's why I keep, I kept picking on the principal's role here. Yes, I think the teacher probably was doing a power play the way this is worded. Yes, I think that if we were gonna retitle the name of this case study, we would call it Bobby the Turd because that's what we've all agreed on. But the principle is the key here. And that is what this class is about. School-based administration to make sure that we have followed procedure and policy, if the policy is in place, to be consistent, that we can defend anything we do so that Mr. Michaels, while he still may not like what we have done, has no defense. He can't, he can't come at us and say, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Michaels, you feel that way, but I'd like to remind you that you're on the school board that voted for it. This, that's, how we, that's how we do. We, as school-based administrators, have policy, and we, it is, we are paid to make that work and to, to, to uphold the policy. So to me, this case, it, that's what I love about case studies. That's what I love about this portion of the class. They, they, Dale and I have talked about this. The way you can get sidetracked on centering on Bobby, the way you can get sidetracked to centering on the teacher, the way you can get sidetracked about centering on Mr. Michaels, the way you can get sidetracked about centering on the principal. To me, the key to this piece is the principal. And, and that is why I love this case study is you are all in here to discuss the role of the school base administrator and you handled it beautifully. That's my editorial comment. Look at the time. We've got a minute and a half to go, Dale. End it. In North Carolina, 115C, 288A, uh, grade and classify students. It starts from there. But that lesson plan, if you noticed, with that law, all 115C, 288, and the four ethical paradigms, you notice I have titled that lesson plan, The Role of the Principal. How prescient. Next week, what do we got next week? We got case study two. What's next week's case? Letter to the community. Letter to the community. The Leandro case. Well, that's going to be a barn burner. I can't wait on that one. Y'all did great tonight. Yeah. Remember, you got to look outside of you in your classroom. You got to swing at that thinking to be more global in terms of the principal and even beyond that to the superintendent and to the district level. I think you're getting there. Good job tonight. I appreciate it. We'll see you next week for Letter to the Community. Have a great week. Thank you. Night, everybody. Good job. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.